So, Baru, how have you been? Uh, well, do you, do you know that feeling you get when you've been depressed and you've been eating nothing but junk food for weeks, weeks, months even, and then you take your first bite of a, of a stick of celery and it's the best tasting thing that you've ever had in your fucking life. Okay, you lost me with that second half, but yes, go on. <laughs> well, I watched a movie called The Card Counter recently. <laughs> and and was The Card Counter your, sick, your stick of celery? <laughs> it was a bit of a stick of celery, I gotta say. I mean, it certainly had peanut butter and raisins on top, but, you know, it was still, it was still a... A healthful time. Yeah, I wanted to uh, kind of come in and process about um, taking a look at uh, Paul Schrader's new movie, The Card Counter, which is a, a kind of sort of follow up to First Reformed, which is a kind of sort of follow up to Taxi Driver. Which, yeah, I was going to say it's it's really um, another in the Paul Schrader extended universe of that kind of guy movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> movies about that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Movies about that one fucking guy. And Paul Schrader, it would be kind of, I think it would be kind of a stretch to insinuate that he is that guy, but I think he wants to understand, more so he wants to understand that guy. And Wait, he, he, his work comes off as if it comes from a place of maybe understanding how one could be that guy. Yeah, exactly. But but wanting to interrogate like I uh, like what being that guy would mean, mm -hmm. you know, a, a sort of there but for the grace of God go I mentality, uh, which allows him both a, a good level of you know like empathy for his subjects without maybe without the over identification with the subjects that those kinds of films can sometimes have. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's been kind of a learning curve for, for him as a writer, for certain. I mean, Taxi Driver, I have kind of issues with that. Like, I am all for the intent of Taxi Driver as a work, but in, the thing about art is that intent um kind of gets lost. And uh, sometimes you make a movie and someone watches it and decides to try to kill the president, which was based, I don't want to come across, like... The guy that tried to kill Reagan, very based, one way or another. Should have aimed higher. Should have aimed higher. <laughs> like, regardless of whether he was doing it for pedophile reasons, um, that was uh, that was a very good moment uh, and something that Paul Schrader uh, really contributed to society. Um, I don't. I don't want to insinuate. So Paul Schrader is a man, and he is yes. an he is an old man, and he is an old white man. Uh, and these <laughs> who are who posts all... on Facebook. <laughs> who posts a lot on Facebook? Oh man, we'll get into that. Uh, but these are all very important things to consider when we understand that, like, he's not not an idiot. And if someone were to really grill me and ask me why I have uh so much patience for him as opposed to other, you know, of the same kind of genre and, and cadre of directors, I wouldn't really have an answer for you other than. He made Mishima. Yeah. I mean, that's that go that goes a long way. It really does for me. <laughs> I really enjoyed the card counter. I thought it was really fucking good. Um, Jay, you were you were a fan of First Reformed. How did how did you kind of fare with with card counter? Or I remember I remember you being a fan of First Reformed. Oh, right? I, I, I am. I, I really liked it. I, I, I feel like we have a, a differing thing in that I, I like First Reformed a lot more than Card Counter, mm -hmm. but I still like Card Counter. And I think you said Card Counter gave you what you felt First Reformed was missing. Yes, um, which is actually doing actually doing the thing, although I really want to rewatch First Reformed because I think I would have a much more um, sort of nuanced kind of take on it, right? Because First Reformed has this sort of ambiguity to it. Uh, sorry for spoilers. Uh, ambiguity to it as far as kind of whether he does, you know, what he says. What he does. Do. Yeah. I, I, the thing I like about First Reformed is so, and get, you know, you can, you can tell me if that's wrong, versus Card Counter, where I feel like it's sort of, is a question of what do you do in the face of your own 
demonstrably evil actions in the yeah. name of empire first reformed is sort of what do you do with the feeling of hopelessness in the face of demonstrably evil actions of the empire rather than as a participant in it yeah uh, so I, I would say first reformed is like the the guilt of am i being a bystander do i need to be doing more is the only option death for myself right. and the, and and the villains around me and first reformed is sort of more these people aren't going to these people are are still going to be alive in our society and what is it that we could possibly hope to see come from them still being members of our society yeah. like um i i i i think it's it's interesting in that they both sort of start at uh not even coming to the question of like you know like can anything be done and first reformed it's like no fucking of course not uh <laughs> and in you know card counter it's not coming to the question of can you ever be forgiven because again f fucking course not <laughs> yeah and I really like that it's like, okay, so like if that question, you know, question asked and answered, it sort of does the, both of those films deal with the like, okay, so what next? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I feel like First Reformed maybe gets more at the psychology of that sort of feeling than uh, Card Counter does. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, I feel like both films don't necessarily have an answer because it, they both sort of start at the idea that like these aren't these aren't questions with answers. Yeah, a hundred thousand uh, percent. I I completely agree, and I'm totally with you there. Like, I and I would almost call Card Counter like a sequel or like a response or whatever to First Reformed in the sense that like First Reformed is the situation where you're kind of witnessing the radicalization process, whereas. Uh, card counter it's like he's already gone through so much of his sort of emotional you know of his sort of emotional growth around like his own contributions and his own uh kind of torturing of people his own crimes his own you know sins and things like that uh like you you get this sense like first reformed is like somebody kind of falling into radicalism and then like card counter is like what you get after the radicalism which is like this person who is still really like struggling with themselves but has kind of reconciled their powerlessness but is like aware of the fucked upness but is also like yolo you know what i mean yeah uh and i think that makes for like a severely interesting character um you know, as far as where I'm, as far as where I, like, where I'm coming at the movie from, uh, and where, like, I'm concerned, like, I thought that, like, the character having this kind of, like, guilt complex and, like, all of the things that Paul Schrader says in interviews about how the, car the card counting lifestyle is, like, this kind of half living, you know, uh, it's, it's not really active, it's kind of passive, uh, and it's kind of dissociative as well, uh, that's something that I find like really kind of self-evidently interesting in mm. in the context of someone who's uh dealing with like extreme extreme guilt i want to point out that like paul paul himself says that like there's not really specifically any torture scenes in the movie um but there's scenes where like you can tell that torture is happening and i really have such a deep appreciation for the fact that like in those scenes you don't really like you can see kind of glimpses of the torture that like the inmates are experiencing but it's more about like torturing the audience with this like insanely anamorphic lens that just makes you feel super motion sick uh and like you're about to fall like the way that people's like legs kind of warp into the bottom of the frame is like super yeah it's so sickening. It's like the audience is getting tortured the whole time. It's really interesting. It, I, I feel like it's also on a, on a formal level. It's definitely they're using the sort of if you've ever watched like YouTube VR videos without a VR headset, that's what yeah. they look like. And so it's very obvious that they were essentially using cameras that are intended for that normally to just create a completely distorted effect. This basically the idea of uh 
stuff that is filmed to be immersive but completely removed from what would make it immersive so it just makes it hyper dissociative feeling instead yeah yeah a hundred a hundred percent um and, and yeah the the soundtrack in every one of those scenes is just fucking uh, is so fucking brutal yeah yeah like the fact that it's kind of inflicting the torture on you as opposed to like the sort of you know diegetic sort of inmates or whatever is is, is really fucking cool and it, it seems like a much more purposeful uh choice than paul's usual kind of idiosyncratic stuff right like yeah <laughs> sometimes sometimes paul will shoot a scene in black and white just to shoot it in black and white because <laughs> he wants to because he's, Cause he's like i think it looks neat yeah because <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's like it's cool man fun to see uh him working with willem dafoe again uh obviously um but like the the other the other parts of this cast were also really uh really crucial um i mean like i i, I thought tiffany tiffany haddish was fucking great i was i was about to bring her up because i casting her to play literally the most normal human being on earth yeah <laughs> perfect like she's so perfect in the role and it's like really impressive how much she stands out precisely because she's just a normal person like she is yeah the the platonic ideal of a co-worker <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like the way that she kind of stands out among, like, especially kind of the other, like, poker champ guys, I, God, I really thought a lot of the, the sort of, like, side stuff, like, the America, the, like, the clearly, like, the really Trumpy guys who are, like, yeah in the, winning all the poker championships, and, like, the fucking, the guy who, like, during the championship, like, stands up and takes his shirt off and is just like, I can't do this anymore! Uh... That stuff is, like, a really fun and really interesting. Like, as much as I think Paul just kind of wanted to hang out in casinos for a while, it's also, like, a genuine kind of unflinching sort of look at what casino culture is and how actually, how little fun people are having at these events. It's, it's, it's very, it's very much so that sort of classic cinema thing of just, like, Oh, you learned like as much about these kinds of scenes as possible, and what you came back with from it, though, it's just that it's like, oh, it just like it sucks. <laughs> like that in which they break down that it's like, yeah, like all the big poker players are just forever in debt. Oh God, yeah, it's really it's pretty depress. I I feel like the only thing that would have made it less depressing is if like furries just kind of showed up and started like <laughs> party crashing the blackjack table, which is like a thing that happens at BLFC. Uh, it's really fun to. It's self it's like self evidently fun to watch a like dyed hair like twink beat a bunch of like old men who do this all the time. You know I, what I, I mean? A dyed hair twink in like a custom Kigurumi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the only thing that the card counter was really missing was that I, I I would have loved to seen of him sitting forlornly at the uh Ellen at the Ellen machine. <laughs> <laughs> the, it, the infamous the, the the for some reason just completely infamous at this point ellen machine like i have <laughs> mentioned that machine to people who don't go to furry con furry cons and they know about that machine because it's crazy. just like it's like infamous i guess even in like casino culture <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if it's just like a particularly bad one or what it's just it just is so garish and stands out so much like in any space that it's in you stand there and you're like why the heck does ellen degeneres have a slot machine this is so funny and so silly and then two seconds later you're down five hundred dollars yeah and, and then and then a gun comes out of the machine and it robs you <laughs> <laughs> and then you get workplace abused yeah <laughs> i i don't know i i just really i just really appreciated it as a, as this sort of basic like morality play thing that paul is so obsessed with doing um i liked the scene where he threatens the kid uh with torture it's uh, so so good because it reveals that like another driving factor of his guilt and why he sort of places these restraints on himself in his life is because he's like you know the, the whole spiel he gives where he's like i i was good at it like he's yeah, like he's like I he's like 
Yeah, like, like, yeah, just like, just like, kid, like, the reason I've been trying to shy you away from this is because the thing you need to realize is that, like, we did this because we fucking could. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you can't, like, yeah, the guys at the top, you know, all got away without taking any accountability. But, like, you, me and your dad did this shit because, like, we fucking wanted to and we were good at it. Yeah. Yeah. How do you reckon with the fact that, like, your life's calling is torture and causing and not only do you have like yeah like not only do you have a capacity for evil but you have acted on that capacity for evil and you liked it yeah it it was like something that you got like you got on the horse immediately and you were like super good at it and uh, yeah you know which is a uh, yeah it which is obviously a lot um but i don't know i i i just think there was a lot of a lot that the movie had to say that was really interesting about how about like obviously how people kind of take the fall like the 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 folks in the Abu Ghraib photographs who yeah. like let's be clear here those those are evil photos of evil people doing evil deeds uh and at the same time like card counter brings up a very good point about the, how the people in the photos got in trouble and the people who told them to do the things that they're doing in the photos really yeah the people never, who put them in the photos never got in trouble got yeah. promotions got retirement like i no i was blown that. away at how just blatantly documentary and the, the film would get sometimes about that stuff just like newsreel footage just straight up open facts about like hey here are like the the people who did this and got away with it mm-hmm Maybe now is a good time to kind of talk a little bit about his um his wonderful online presence on Facebook dot com as immortalized on a Twitter account My a, a, a presence so infamous that there is a Twitter account dedicated to documenting it. Yeah, literally. I enter unwashed into a world that disrespects me and despises my values. Just oh. Just some real drill tweet shit. Just like, him posting a picture of the main actors of Coward Counter flipping off the camera <laughs> and said, what the actors of my new movie think of me, which implies that they sent him that photo. <laughs> that they just yeah. took the photo and sent it to him. <laughs> His post on 9-11 of 2021, like, never forget. But let's hear what Paul has to say. I've uh -huh. always been baffled by those who have transformed the most successful terrorist attack in history into an America the Great moment. It's the same th it's the same thinking that transformed Jesus Christ into a capitalist. Paul, it's 9/11. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you posting this? It's on the day uh, th it's the day. But like that I don't know. That also like reflexively gives me so much respect for him because that's so fucking funny to say yeah oh, and he's, he's so... like not wrong he's not yeah no he's he's like he's not wrong <laughs> someone, <laughs> someone replied <laughs> someone replied like this is how you promote a fucking movie <laughs> like <laughs> so, so fucking funny such a big old man brain <laughs> that's very <laughs> wrinkled <laughs> yeah i mean he's had fo he's had posts deleted from uh facebook for having the n-word in them where he was like <sighs> he was like discussing some like racist shit that like he and his friends did in the you know 60s or whatever and it's <sighs> it's just like man you you really want him to like understand <laughs> uh, i don't know it, it's 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 kind of this like double-edged sword where it's like he, you you want him to uh maybe be a little bit more realistic and a little bit more of a part of this world, but his brain is just so interesting. And the, like, it's, it, he, he really has just this, like, I, the, so part of my other thing of like, why does Paul write guys like that is like, I don't think it's necessarily, I think the part of them where it's like the reason he writes guys like that is because he relates to them. And I think it has a lot less to do with like their capacity for evil. And I think it has a lot more to do with like, they all kind of talk with the same affectation Paul has, which is like, just does not understand social norms. <laughs> yeah. Just like does not like just inappropriate social affect. 
is there even a way to be appropriate on social media, you know? And I think that's something, like, this, something that I kind of said in our Discord is, is ostensibly that, like, I, I give him a little bit more leeway on, on certain things because it's very kind of kind of clear the whole time that he's talking that, like, he has no idea how he feels about the yeah. shit that he is saying <laughs> or, like, the shit that he's talking about and exploring. And, like, he clearly, like, that conflict carries over to his attitudes on social media and what social media is and and how he kind of tends to get wrangled by you know production companies and things like that for saying genuinely crazy shit no he he is is that sort of rare director where i can appreciate stuff he does or writer and director I could appreciate stuff he does precisely because it it's such an unfinished thought. Yeah. Like 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 I said, like with both first reformed and the other one, you know, he puts out these questions that don't have answers because he's like aware that they're questions without answers. So he's just like, well, you know, he's like, there's there's no other way to really investigate or like feel these things out other than to put them out there as a conversation. And the medium of art and and film is a great way to put them out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, sidebar, very funny to me how the trailer, how the trailers for this movie advertised it. <sighs> yeah, I mean. So if if you haven't seen them at home, uh, we're talking about you know the fact that like you know a pretty big theme in this is obviously Abu Ghraib war crime. You know he 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 is a war criminal who is basically living as a guy who who gambles and keeps as low of a profile as possible essentially because he's just disassociative and numb and it's like that's you know he 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 did better in prison because it was a place where he felt like he was being punished as he deserved um and the ads for this film make it look like that era of movies when there was like 700 casino heist movies that came out <laughs> Yeah, it, the <laughs> like ad makes it looks look like, kind of like Ocean's Eleven, which is it, like really it not. It looks like there was gonna be some like ah, I'm keeping a low profile because I've got my next big racket coming, right? Uh, and you know, it's like ah, what's what are these secrets he has? You know, like ah, is this gonna be is this gonna be a, a fun mystery thriller? And then in like the first fifteen minutes of the film, it's just like oh no, he's a he's a war criminal. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. There's nothing deeper than that. He's a war criminal. <laughs> yeah, it's like, God, imagine if you walked into Ocean's Eleven and, like, the first shot was just this, like, uncompromisingly horrific shot of Abu Ghraib. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, really different vibe. Uh, yeah, a lot of people don't really... Uh, I don't know. Like, Paul seems seems really interested in, um, in this kind of career stage to do you know smaller budget things that he gets final caught on there was a whole snafu with uh you know uh, with with a nicholas cage movie that he made that got you know butchered essentially uh that kind of got him on this tip and i i, I think it's really good i i think these are like you know re really good turns for him and also uh it's <laughs> it's hard to see like the bad trailer problem kind of kind of re-arise you know what i mean yeah i i i have been this will be a rant i'll go on someday and I'm, I'm sure their trailers have gotten so bad mm -hmm. well well i i'm gonna make you go see antlers when it comes out because we can definitely talk about it on that because antlers had a pre-covid trailer and then it had a post-covid trailer and like you put them up against each other and the first one is so good and the second one is so bad and i don't know if it's going to be a good or bad movie but like i know which trailer got me interested in seeing it yeah and i i, I feel like when i see trailers now i have to try to figure out it what the movie is actually going to be because you can just like the trailers are just sloppy they both reveal too much and also like not anything about the film they're all structured they all try to like restructure a film to hit certain plot beats or it's kind of it's fit been... it into people's idea of like what xyz movie is gonna be you know what i mean give directors 
final cut on both the movie and the trailer, maybe. But I, yeah, no, I don't know. I can't. I can't really look into the minds of producers and production companies or whatever. Yeah, I have. I have no idea. Like, real honestly, I don't know a lot about what goes into the production end of of trailers. Um, I'm sure that it's just because we're in a weird moment right now where they don't really know what people want to see in theaters, and so they're just kind of throwing and trying to fit trailers into trailers that were successful before. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, rich people are probably feeling feeling a little bit of anxiety right now. Like, you know, we're, what are people... They should. Yeah. <laughs> But they not do- for this reason. <laughs> <laughs> they damn well should be. Because, uh, like, yeah, I don't know. What do people want to see? There's this whole... There's some sort of article where some some rich idiot was like, oh, we're pivoting to, you know, family-friendly, wholesome... That's what That's what the people want. That's what we think the people want. It's escapism, family, wholesome shit. And it's just like, okay, good luck! <laughs> Like I, I personally, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I can't speak for anybody else. I'm in the mood to have my like brain scooped out by an ice cream scooper by every movie that I see. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. But uh, whatever you can, whatever. Just sell the card counter as Ocean's Eleven. Fuck it. You know. I, I think the thing that's really funny about that too is that it's like, you know, talking to people who have kids and stuff. And who want to see family friendly movies? The thing about that is that they're not re- they don't really want to go see movies in theaters right now because they can just watch movies at home with their kids yeah. <laughs> for like way cheaper. <laughs> oh, way less hassle. Your kid isn't like screaming in the middle of the theater and pissing everybody off. Like, yeah, no, it's 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 such a like you know that's that's sort of part of the big reason why the 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 sort of ways in which a lot like you know disney is getting sued for for shifting to streaming and violating a bunch of contracts is be precisely because the fact that like yeah a lot of people are going to be taking that if it's an option yeah and you know there's there's, there can be all kinds of arguments about whether or not they should yada 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 but it's a thing where it's like if that's like what you're trying to to pivot to that's like not those are not the kind of movies that people are seeing in theaters right now I really like the card counter. I really want more movies like the card counter, and I I don't know how to. Uh... It's it seems like as the movie kind of business gets a little bit more tenuous, it's either you know I'm either gonna get a lot more like the card counter or absolutely nothing like this is gonna happen ever again. <laughs> the card counter obviously kind of has this thing going on, where Chekhov's gun basically goes off. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel I feel a little conflicted about that, and I I actually I mean I re- I have uh, I I lented Paul's book from the library on on transcendental style and film, uh, which you can get at your local library prob probably I don't fucking know. I mean I feel I feel like if there would like a decent decent size or selection maybe. Yeah. I don't, I feel I feel like Schrader's a pretty pretty mainstream ish director that that's got to be accessible in a lot of places yeah for sure you know he's like he's like if you're if he's like if you're someone who's into movies in any sense you know if you dig a little like an inch of grime deeper than scorsese you're gonna get schrader (laughs) yeah literally so i don't know i'm i'm i i just cracked into it but i have kind of in advance kind of like looked up a lot of his points and a lot of interviews about uh kind of what he what he thinks about transcendentalism and i almost wish there was more of it in the card counter um i think the only real place where it's kind of notable is like the ending shot of tiffany haddish and oscar isaac's like fingers on the glass for a really long time um oh that's such a such a beautiful shot it's a really beautiful shot my only problem with it is that you can tell that it's slowed down <laughs> yeah yeah it does <laughs> it it I I thought that uh, the projection had fucked something up at first until the credits started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope to see something that is... I hope to see from him something from him that's, like, kind of uncritically and, like, unafraid to be, like, oh, you know, like, Yasujiro Ozu fan art, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Because there's elements of this that are, like... And, and I think that's kind of uh, something that 
gets a little lost in translation. Like, at a certain point, you have to make a movie that's marketable, right? You have to make a movie that people are going to want to fucking watch. But I want to see the movie that Paul wants to watch. You know what I mean? Mm, no, yeah, I definitely get it. You, you want to see what could Paul Schrader make completely outside the studio system? Yeah. Like, if he was completely given free reign to just make any kind of movie he wants. Yeah. And I I don't want to say that this isn't that, um, but I more just like I don't know I I, I you can you can feel the invisible hand of the market on his shoulder. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. And and I think that like the places where card counter sags is in the style department, where for example, like first reformed is like really 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 strong throughout. Um, whereas Card Counter has, like, really, in- some really interesting set pieces, but, it- but, uh, and, like, if you're really paying attention, you can tell the sort of mise-en-scene of Card Counter is, like, something that's more studied or whatever. Uh, but if you're not paying attention, it can kind of come across as, like, a normal movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and the last thing I want from Paul is a normal movie. I want, I want more Mishima. I want more bullshit. I want more fan art. You know, just him, him kind of in his element. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's fair. I think that's, it is always interesting to think about what a director could be doing if they were allowed to sort of do what they do more. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess that's sort of the big struggle of art is, you know, producing it outside of the market structure even even if you are a director who especially if you are a director who historically has made stuff within that uh it is it is always kind of weird to consider you know like how david lynch kind of was in the market structure and then like kind of got out of it like by by just making a bunch of flops that people hated and then now loved and then it <laughs> came back around to him getting to make Twin Peaks season three, which is like 13 hours of just him being allowed to do whatever the fuck he wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> With like a definitely like a way higher budget than he was used to having. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I, I want to see Paul Schrader's Twin Peaks season three is what I'm saying. <laughs> I want to see I want to see Taxi Driver two. Yeah. I want. You know what? What happened to Travis after that whole situation? Where where did he head off to? It could be about Travis's son. Uh, <laughs> Travis touchdown. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's Paul Schrader presents no more heroes. Uh, I oh god! What if Paul made a video game? Oh man, a a Paul Schrader like like brought on to like do the script work for a video game would be so funny <laughs> but I, I i think if he had the right crew that he was working with i think you could actually get something really good out of that yeah a video game about like a like retired stunt actor who was like an underground fighter or whatever and he has to work with like some greenhorn like programmer who is working like 80 hour weeks paul my email, Baru with six O's, yes. two R's at gmail.com. I could, I could have the pitch for you on your desk by the, by the end of the month. I, can I have can, it. I, I'll listen. I'm a fast writer. I can just, I can sit in front of the keyboard. I, you, you know how it is. We in this house, we tentatively, uh, hesitantly support Paul Schrader's. <laughs> we, we, it's not so much a stand, so much as like, <laughs> yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Facebook post about how you keep getting crushes on lesbians <laughs> or actresses. Oh God, don't I know it, Paul? Yeah, I was gonna say. I think we're at a, we're at about time. Um, there's some uh, K cups in the lobby if you would like any. Oh yeah, I, I I mean, do you have any any decaf or like I don't know. Tea? Um, I mean, I'll be honest. The the the, the there's probably like maybe five percent caffeine of like a regular cup of coffee in those things i'm pretty sure they're just like free dries flavored dirt well i you know i'll I'll drink the sludge I, yeah okay all right 
Well, get home safe. <laughs> I'll, I'll, oh, man. I'll do my best. <laughs>